All right. Thank you, everyone, and welcome for joining today's EU Circular Talks. Uh, today's uh, subject is switching to the circular economy to tackle carbon emission. We're doing this in two parts. So the first part of this EU Circular Talk is today, and then we have a second part on 28th of June. Um, Today's talk is focusing on carbon emission accounting and a direct tool to close the loops in a circular economy. We have some meeting rules before getting started. So first of all, I'm Cassandra Julin. I'm heading uh, PR and communication at Normative. And Normative is uh, very happy to co-sponsor co this talk today. This event will be recorded. Uh, you can ask questions, so use the chat function for that, uh, and also to share any information and links to other participants. Uh, you can also raise your hand to ask a question and then wait for the moderator to give you the floor, so that is me. Um, and once you have the floor, we will enable your microphone and camera, and then you will then be able to unmute yourself and turn your camera off. Uh, uh, mute, unmute yourself and turn your camera on so that you will be able to talk. Um, the first part of this um, webinar, uh, you're going to hear from a bunch of experts in the field. And then this last half an hour, we're going to focus on the Q&A session where you will be able to ask all your questions. So today we have John Comer, he's a member of the European Economic and Social Committee. We have Christian Run, CEO and co-founder of Normative. We have Johan Falk, CEO and co-founder of Exponential Roadmap Initiative. We have Stefan Gartner, Head of Communication Partnership and Sustain Sustainability at Bonpain. We have Julia Breidenstein, uh, PR Manager at Humana. Uh, and Pamela Juven, uh, Director of the SME Climate Hub. Um, so, uh, without further delay, I'd like to introduce our first speaker. We're starting with uh, John, um, John Comer. Welcome. Thank you very much, Cassandra. I hope you can all hear me and uh, see me well. Yes, yes. Indeed. and, and, and uh, I'd like to start by saying that I'm uh, probably not an expert in anything, but in life. I, you can see by my face, I have already reached an age where you gain experience in life. And I think that's the most valuable experience you could have, actually, if you could only put it back on a young person's shoulders. But anyway, uh, I'm absolutely delighted to be here. And I would like to start by by thanking Normative, uh, our co-sponsors, uh, for putting forward the focus uh, on measuring carbon emissions in, and closing the loop uh, in, in, in a circular e economy, because it's very, very timely. Uh, and very topical uh, uh, and absolutely needs needs to be achieved. Uh, just in the way of some some context, uh, uh, because there's always uh, new stakeholders and, and new people on, on, on the circular talks. Uh, and, uh, you know, back in 2017, the SC and the Commission came together uh, and launched uh, the, the European Circular Economy Stakeholders Platform, which is why we're here. And, Perhaps it was born out of a, an opinion that was created by the European Economic Social Committee, uh, by, by Killeen Logan in, in terms of the circular economy. That possibly was the genesis of it. Maybe other people will, will, will claim responsibility for the setup of it. But today's meeting is exactly uh, what would have been in mind by the people that started this, this platform uh, for, you know, a place to share information, new technologies, new innovations, and a place where you can, you know, link policy uh, with practice, which is of critical importance because uh, there has to be a, a, um, there has to be a very strong link uh, between the two of them. Um, you know, the EEC is currently producing uh, a lot of a lot of work in this area uh, to 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 try and steer legislation and policy uh, to make it pragmatic. Uh, and and uh, effective uh, and and streamlined with what business is requiring and what consumers are requiring uh, and all the while remaining sustainable and competitive at the same time because they're intrinsically linked uh, if European producers 
lose their edge or their competitiveness, uh, then it won't be sustainable. I know people say, well, we all know that. Uh, but sometimes when you see some proposed legislative uh, documents, you don't actually take it for granted anymore when, when, when you get to see some of the detail that's produced in some places uh, and it certainly needs to be tweaked uh, and, and, and tailored. So the EEC most recently have produced uh, some some very valuable opinions in 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 my opinion, uh, not least net 846, which is restoring uh, carbon uh, cycles, which of course is 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 of critical importance uh, that 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 we do that. And I know it mightn't be specific to today's topic, uh, but you know you have to take a holistic approach. Uh, in terms of, of the carbon and from, from the agricultural sector, there's a lot of sequestration uh, has to be has to be accomplished, as well as the carbon capture and and um, re uh, uh, putting it back into 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 other goods. Now also in Rex uh, 5531, uh, the carbon markets emergency uh, structure and challenges for the European industry. And I'd invite everybody to read these opinions in detail. I'm not going to go into the, the detail of them on this platform today uh, because it would take a lot of time but there is very good conclusions and recommendations contained in those and also in that 843 and all these are available on on the EESC website uh, uh, and that 843 is fit for 55 delivering uh, on the EU's 2030 climate targets which which of course is is critically important as well and, and before we go on to to good practices and maybe some pragmatic exa examples, you know, the reality is that we have to create a, 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 a production environment where our vulnerability in terms of competitiveness and potential uh, higher costs for European consumers uh, is well mitigated against as well as 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 the uh, uh, as the greenhouse gases are mitigated because if we don't do that and if we don't incorporate strong robust uh, trade deals legislation for the trade deals that doesn't expose us uh, to 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 areas of 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 imports that just doesn't have the same uh, environmental credentials as the ones that we have to compete against here in Europe. Because remember, these trade deals uh, have, have tools and flows, and we all hear about the agricultural side of it, importing agricultural products, whereby uh, the European Union exports its, its white goods and services. Uh, and I can assure you that the, the, the representatives that we have uh, creating the, the the framework for the for the trade deals. There are no fools and they make sure there are good trade deals for Europe. But sometimes they don't take account of the whole the whole picture and sometimes they're riddled. In fact, I go as far as saying a lot of the time they're riddled with contradictions. And that's why we need to we, we need to focus uh, on the detail and and we need to make sure uh, that we don't also have, we have another vulnerability currently in Europe, uh, and, and, and that is the clear messaging that needs to come because people associate uh, sometimes the circular economy with higher costs. And people are suffering right now, uh, and, and our democracies in a time of superinflation can become uh, under some pressure because ordinary citizens like me and you and, and, and most of the people on the platform sometimes lash out at governments uh, and the demand, the demand change. And sometimes we have to, we have to make sure uh, that, we have, that we have clear, clear, precise messaging around the sustainable element in, 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 in our circular economy. And the fact that uh, we're, not, we're not losing out to our competitors in Europe. I don't wish to harp on about it, but I, I, I see that as a, as a strong vulnerability, uh, particularly uh, with the inflation in terms of energy and so on that's coming forward. Just, you know, as I said originally, I'm not a particular expert on any of these. I've worked on a, on a lot of opinions. I've worked primarily actually on, on the CBAM uh, uh, 
and I, I see vulnerabilities in the, in the CBAM as well in, 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 in terms of the, the accounting and the default position uh, and, and some loopholes there uh, for exposing some European businesses to perhaps unfair competition. Maybe this isn't the correct platform for it, but I just reference it because I feel the, the need to do that. Uh, and and I, I will finish up by by referring to, and I, I'm not sure my screen is not quite showing it, but I, there, there is one slide there uh, in, in terms of uh, what we would have uh, for, for good practice. And that indeed is for for the the uh, Implas uh, company, which which is a centre for innovation uh, technology, uh, uh, innovation and technology, uh, and they're doing a lot of good work. You know, and Implas it, it helps companies, and I do believe we would have a lot of stakeholder companies here today in the circle to, to apply the circular uh, economy criteria to their business models and to turn legislative ch uh, changes. Uh, affecting plastics industry into opportunities. And this is the critical one, to make sure that they have the ability to turn it into an opportunity uh, and, and remain profitable. So Implas also uh, carries out research into areas such as recycling, uh, biodegradable materials and products, and the use of biomass and CO2. Uh, and I'd refer you to their website because it's, it's uh, excellent. Uh, in, in that area. And, and you know, the, 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 the PUCO2 project uses research and development to com combat uh, global warming uh, caused by greenhouse gases. And there's 17 companies uh, have taken part uh, in, 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 in these initiatives. Uh, and you know, there's, there's ordinary everyday items which are there in textiles, automotive, toy industry, adhesives. Uh, and there are other companies as well, and there are other good examples that I won't go into de to detail on, but you have Divardi, and they're all they're all there on, on, on the website. And you, you know, you have a company called uh, uh, Covestro, uh, which, you know, puts carbon and stores carbon into some some other products that we use every day of the week. So the reality is, and, and, and just to, 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 to finish up by saying to meet our climate objective, uh, we have to transform the throwaway society, but we have to do it in a way that doesn't uh, expose us to, to unfair competition and to make sure uh, that the definition of, of, of sustainability is, is the correct one. So with that, I'd uh, like to thank everybody again and hand you back to Cassandra, uh, our esteemed host for the day. Thank you. Thank you, John. And I very much agree with you, you know, competitive and sustainable does go hand in hand and it doesn't necessarily mean more expensive. A lot of circular solutions are actually a lot cheaper than, you know, the, the less circular options out there and good examples of that are reuse. Uh, when it comes to carbon, I think you're spot on there that, you know, the way we produce carbon right now, it is waste um, because there's just too much of it that we cannot take care of. But it's very interesting to hear about these businesses that you highlighted that takes carbon and makes it into something useful and puts it back into the system in circular loops. So thank you for sharing that. Uh, moving on to our next speaker, uh, who's going to put uh, circular economy and carbon emissions into perspective and explain a little bit how it all comes together and is linked. It's Christian Run, uh, he's CEO and co-founder of Normative. All right, thank you, Cassandra. Uh, thanks for, for being here. Um, I'm gonna share my screen and give you a little bit of an overview of, of how, how carbon accounting fits into circular economy. So, I mean, I am obviously excited about carbon accounting because, uh, you know, we are producing carbon accounting software at Normative. But I'm also the first one to say that carbon accounting is useless unless it drives sustainable decision making. And making more circular decisions is the pathway for which carbon accounting can actually have an impact. So, so that is why I'm, I'm, I'm super excited to, to talk about how the two things are, are linked together. Um, so I'm just going to show a few slides on, on how it is linked. So, I mean, most of you have, have probably, you know, already seen this slide. First of all, can you see my screen? Because I'm not sure if it is showing. Yes, thank you. It's perfect, Christian. Okay, brilliant. So, I mean, right now, and, and you have seen this before, our current system is linear. 
So that means that we have a linear value creation throughout the value chain. So let's say, for instance, I'm, I'm you know, a retailer of, of you know, steel uh, furniture that is, is meant to be outside in the garden. Uh, then you know, the steps to produce that steel furniture in the value chain uh, is, is, is multiple. And, and just kind of a simplified version is that you start with mining and then you add some value uh, to the process by, by mining uh, you know, the, the metals for the steel. Uh, but that also releases steel too. Uh, then you might, you know, uh, manufacture the, the subcomponents of the steel table that also adds some CO2, but also some value. Uh, and then thirdly, you might assemble the final product uh, and, and then ship it to the retailer. And all of those things add value to the process, uh, but also releases greenhouse gas emissions. So then when you have emitted all of that CO2 just to dump it in a landfill in a linear fashion, doesn't make any sense whatsoever, but it is done over and over again. So I mean, in order for circular economy to work, actors in complex value chain need to make the right decisions together because the mining is not done by the same company that is doing the assembly or that are doing the retail. So you need this kind of global coordination where the retailer realizes that, oh, maybe instead of throwing this away, you know, I can take the product back and, and resell it. Or, or the assembly uh, company can, can realize that, oh, actually, you know, I, I, I can take, you know, the, the old tables and, and repair them. Uh, and or the manufacturing company can realize that why, why not use you know, re recycled metals in order to produce this table, because then I don't need to use virgin materials and, and metals. And, and this is where carbon accounting enters the picture. So carbon accounting can be this really powerful tool for actors in complex value chains to make the right decisions. So if you get the right data at the point of decision making, where you can clearly see as as you know, the retailer that, you know, okay, if I reuse this thing, there's only the transportation that is emitting greenhouse gases. So maybe that's only one kilo or where the, uh, the company that does the assembly realizes that, that, okay, there will only be four kilos extra for, you know, putting this table together. And, and the manufacturer realized that it's only 10 kilos compared to, you know, a hundred kilos throughout of, of redoing the whole process if I use recycled materials. So obviously these num numbers are just made up, but I think they're, um, they're made up to exemplify a, a good point. And that is the point of the power of 10 when it comes to circular economy, that you know, typically you know, reusing something is 10 times more efficient than you know, doing materials recycling, which is you know, more than 10 times efficient of, than, than using vir virgin materials. So there are savings throughout the process, both in money and in carbon emissions. And, and carbon accounting can be this tool where actors in the value chain can coordinate and, and actually realize that there are savings here by making the right circular decisions. Uh, so, so that's really all, all I had to say, you know, to contextualize a little bit why, why I think, you know, the issues of carbon accounting is an important tool for the circular economy, but also, you know, carbon accounting doesn't have an impact in and of itself, if not circular decisions are taking and, and not sustainable decisions. And I mean, that can be sustainable decisions all throughout the production process, not, not just, you know, choosing the circular materials, but also deciding on what types of transportation should I really use from, from you know, cradle to gate, for instance. Uh, so, so that's, that was basically all I, I had to say. So thanks everyone for listening. Thank you, Christian. Uh, we had a very interesting discussion, you and I, just the other day on the kind of uh, circular economy and the value chain and how it all links together. Um, and, you know, the reason why the value chain is so key, and you showed it here as well, really well that, you know, up to 90% of a business emissions are often located in the value chain. So that is really the driver of carbon emissions. And that why it's so key to work in a circular mindset with the value chain in order to reduce those emissions. Uh, there was a quite interesting BBC article published uh, very recently that looked at e-waste as one of the 
you know, gold mines uh, that we should go mining uh, in the e-waste mountains rather than in the mines for for resources because you know gold and all of these precious uh, metals they're all there and they're all you know ready to be reused if we just get the systems in place to reuse them. That was quite interesting. So let's move on to the other large perspective. So we have Johan Falk with us, uh, CEO and co-founder of Exponential Roadmap Initiative, who will present us with the large enterprise perspective of this discussion. Uh, thank you, Cassandra. I'm very delighted to be here and the great presentations uh, so far. So I'll try to connect to that. Um, we um, uh, we know from a scientific perspective, you know, we need to have emissions every decade. And we talk about these three big transformations. It's about the energy transformation, it's about land and food, and it's about materials. And let's talk about the materials because we won't succeed if we don't crack that one. And we have a tremendous gap there. If I look at Sweden, the circularity gap report show that we are on 5% circularity. It's just a tremendous waste. It's absolutely essential that we get the same focus on the material transformation as on the energy transformation. So I'll talk a little bit about large enterprises, three points, how they align with the 1.5 ambition, which means engaging with your value chain, and also that we need now to integrate circularity as part of our climate strategies, not see it as a separate part. So the four things to align with the 1.5 ambition that the company should do and that we are putting as a requirement uh, from the Exponential Roadmap Initiative is firstly to halve down your own emissions at least by uh, 2030 towards net zero before uh, 2050, but also to halve your value chain emissions by 2030, which is much more of a challenge. And shifting towards climate solutions, that's the third pillar, uh, which could be circa, circular solutions or, or uh, renewable energy and actually solutions with cuts emission. And the fourth pillar is actually about contributing to global net zero. We cannot use, we cannot reach net zero on our own, we have to do it together with our value chain. We have to do it together with society. So that is basically how it works. And um, therefore, for a large enterprise to succeed, to reach your targets, to cut 50% before 2030, you really need to engage with your suppliers and customers with your value chain. That's absolutely essential because as Cassandra said, you might have more than 90% of your emissions up and downstream. And if you're familiar with the GHG protocol, we're talking about material used, and we talk a lot about use of product and, um, and waste. Um, we created some, and that is one reason why we really need to accelerate best practice exponentially and spread it it's not sufficient just to have a few leaders going in the front line. We need sort of all large enterprises to adopt new practices as quickly as possible. So one thing we created uh, was something called the supply chain leaders with a number of leading companies such as IKEA, Ericsson, Unilever, Nestle, etc. with this idea to create and share best practices openly with anyone who could copy it um, and for example, providing something called the supplier engagement guide with best practices. How can you engage with your suppliers to support them to cut emissions radically? How can you request to all your suppliers to halve emissions by 2030 through standard letters, code of conduct, seminars and these type of resources? And we also, what we will talk about uh, from Pamela's side, we also established an initiative for, uh, for small companies called the SME Climate Hub because large companies normally uh, put the focus on the large emitting suppliers, but they uh, miss the long tail of the small suppliers. 
And that is the reason why it's very valuable to have this common global resource so large companies can actually nudge their small companies to join the SME Climate Hub in order to set targets and particularly take action and, and report. Um, it is really important to measure our emissions um, and how we are sort of cutting emissions in our reporting and do that uh, transparently. Uh, but in terms of circularity, I would state we also need sort of forward looking key performance indicators, uh, also focusing on circularity and that we're starting to measure that. And that would be uh, the use of recycled material. We basically need to move away from virgin material as far extent as ever possible. Uh, but we also need to ensure uh, that the material we put into our solutions can be recycled and is not contaminated. The second part is just as important. It's about the use of the product. Like in the fashion industry, the normal use of a product is seven times that is wasted, which is basically horrible. We should aim for at least 10x. We need to build every product for reuse, repairability, a second life, a third life. We need to start to measure that, of course. The third point I like to uh, highlight is that every leading company need to build circularity in their design process and in their strategy process. So it's about designing for uh, circularity from the beginning. You can't fix it afterwards. So to summarize, I mean, large enterprises should align with the 1.5 ambition and that is happening exponentially. So that is a very strong trend. You won't be competitive unless you do that. And that means engaging with your complete uh, value chain. And we also need to set these integrated targets for climate and circularity. Uh, but also to highlight, we need companies going in the absolute front line, but we also need from policy to remove the blockers, which today favor the linear uh, economy. So we need to shift that to favor the circular economy to enable these front runners to actually be uh, super competitive by driving circularity from the front. Thank you. Thank you, Johan. Um, very interesting. I was just scribbling down notes as you were talking uh, on a lot of interesting things. Because just as you say, we need to favor the circular economy, linking very much back to what uh, June was saying in the beginning uh, with sustainable and competitive, that you know it needs to come together also on a policy level, that there is an incentive to do the right thing. Um, I also find it very interesting that you know enterprises uh, commit to half their value chain emissions. Uh, and also design out, um, design in circularity, so to say. But given that so much of the emissions are in the value chain, this is a challenge. And you know, this very much links back to the next perspective of the SMEs that are often part of the value chains and part of the solution for the bigger businesses and linking this all together because it's such a complex puzzle. And uh, I'm very happy about this talk because this brings everyone together and we can start to untang untangle and solve these issues. So thank you for your contribution. I have some more questions for you in the panel. But before that, uh, I'd like to introduce our next speaker, St Stefan Gartner. He's head of communication partnership and sustainability at Bonpin. Bringing us the SME perspective. I mean, it's so great we're saying we want to do these things, but now you're going to tell us what it's like to be in the SME shoes. Yes, hello everyone. Um, indeed, I really hope that uh, our part perspective, our experiences uh, speak to many SMEs who, and let me drop the bombshell right away, who don't measure their emissions, but who nonetheless um, like enact uh, or act a lot to reduce uh, their emissions wherever they can. Uh, and um, obviously, I'm very interested in the SME Climate Hub that Johan uh, mentioned, because we are highly motivated. Um, but um, let me get back to that point at the end of the presentation and start with a little um, explanation of uh, who we are. So um, I work for a company group 
actually in the organic food, se food sector. And at the core of this group, there is the B2B bakery business. Um, we sell traditional bakery products um, with the brand Bonpain, more or less 50 to 60 products. We have another bakery that is um, specialized in gluten-free products under the brand Bon Sens. We also do flour, pasta, coffee, edible packaging. Um, and uh, two years ago, that was not the case uh, because at that time we uh, took the decision to leave the, 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 the retail sector um, as a supplier and uh, to refocus on a different type of client who would reward um, our um, uh, the, the extra mile that we're going because we really have this desire to go beyond the minimum organic um, food standard. And um, as a in the process, uh, we are fast expanding with a vertical integration in the value chain uh, to to create this control, but also to be able to to create these positive externalities in the process. So we now manage the production uh, from farm to fork, and we try to go beyond. Uh, in the circular um, spirit. We doubled the workforce in the process to 72 employees in two years. And we have the plans and we're searching for the financing to establish a serial transformation center in Brussels right now. Sustainability in all of this process has been a strategic decision for us to carve out this niche in the haut gamme, um, but on a bigger scale. Uh, and working uh, with this circular economy, um, principles is for us a, a means to reduce costs. It has a it has its limits, of course, but it's a means uh, we see it as a means to reduce our production costs. How far we push this, that's actually a personal choice. And I think that's the case for uh, a lot of SMEs, actually. So let's talk about um, our emissions. Uh, and we think they are quite modest, actually. Why? Because we are a local business. We source locally as best as we can. We sell in the local market, so we have fewer transportation costs. We have a short value chain with only one major thermic transformation, which is the, the baking process. Uh, everything else um, we do ourselves with our own mills. We have 14 stone mills, so we bring the grain there, we mill it, uh, we make the flour, we, we bake bread with it. But I think in comparison with other value chains, uh, it's quite straightforward. Um, we deliver in bulk and that's also it's a choice. Many clients, they they want us to to deliver in packages. Uh, they they want different types of products and, and we deny it. It's 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 also a cost, but it's something that speaks to our our vision of how we see ourselves. So we deliver in bulk um, our the end of life of our product, uh, the edible products. Uh, it's quite straightforward. It's the digestion. There's not much we can do in the design of the product that will change that. Um, and I think the major emission source, or it's not that I think it, beyond doubt, the major emission source for us is uh, agriculture. Uh, we think it's 60 to 70 percent, uh, and that's down the value chain. Other sources, uh, scope one sources, there are obviously the ovens, uh, the mills, the transportation. We deliver all over Belgium during the night with our own trucks. Um, the non-serial supplies, employee mobility, so all that uh, matters, uh, but agriculture is uh, certainly uh, the, 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 the biggest uh, emitter in, in our value chain. Uh, what are the sustainable business practices that we employ? Um, so we reduce all the externalities um, with solar panels, uh, that run, that power our, our mills. Um, we drive electric cars. Uh, we can't deliver with electric vehicles yet, unfortunately, uh, but we, we want to be the first uh, who do it if the solution exists. Uh, we provide electric scooters to our workforce. We vet external partners like our energy provider, uh, Bolt Energy in this case. Uh, but our energy bill is exploding. It's 30,000 euros a month, just to give you a, an idea, which for many is not a lot, but for an SME is quite a cost. Um, so agroecology, as I said, is or agriculture is the biggest emitter. So agroecology is for us the biggest opportunity for, to reduce these emissions. Uh, unfortunately, perfect circularity is not possible for us because we are um, 
we don't have a direct link to our consumers. But in our value chain, we can do everything uh, that is possible to work in circularity. And um, I would like to ask uh, Cassandra to pull up the illustration of one of our solutions in the value chain to work yes, in yes, circularity. Excellent. That's the one. So um, this is an example um, of the cycle um, of the bread. So let's just start in, in the middle uh, upper part. Uh, we make bread, but we have sometimes overproduction, a surplus of the production. And we also have the, 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 the breads that come back from our clients uh, that are the unsold products. And um, we transform them. We, um, we we separate the good ones from the bad ones, then we kind of create little uh, sticks out of them, uh, we dry them to conserve them, and then we will make beer with it. Uh, one is called, uh, it's a flower power, that's how we call the IPA, um, and the other beer is called grain again, it's a pilz, and we do that with, uh, with another entrepreneur who joined us. Um, and in these beers, then 40% of the barley is replaced by old bread that we give life again to this bread. We keep it in the in the food chain, importantly, um, and then we go further with the with the brewery, so that uh, their um, their uh, it's uh, what is it called in French? It's dresh, but uh, I don't I don't think it's important. Their food weight from the beer production um, it has value. It has a lot of nutrients, and uh, there are uh, feeding worms, and these worms they digest these nutrients, and this um, this can then be put back on the fields to fertilize them, to then grow the cereals again that are transformed to flour and back into bread. Um, and then there's a second example which I would like to show on the next slide, and that is um, the, the 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 circle is almost the same, but here we work with another company. And, and let me just name the company that brews the beer with us. It's called No Waste Republic. So in this name already, you see that the idea is also to create a community towards the consumer and with providers like, like us around this idea of no, no waste. Uh, so back to the mushrooms. Um, there we work with uh, Eclo, formerly Champignon de Bruxelles. They grow um, or they populate our old bread with uh, mycelium and they grow mushrooms on it and the, these are then sold to the consumer, but then also uh, we connected this, created this link with their champost, like the, like the compost uh, from their production, where these, uh, this is then also brought back to the field. And uh, we work directly with the farmers, so we contact them, we ask them, can you use this? Please use this. If you have to transform it, we push them to go the extra mile, and then it gets back into the cycle. So um, this is what, what we do at our level. Uh, we also have a project of um, creating edible packaging um, on the basis of the, the, the waste of the milling process uh, that is in prototype uh, stage. So we have lots of uh, projects um, and uh, we create a community with our suppliers actually to, to, to join us in this. And um, with that, I, I come to the, the last, to my messages or recommendations um, uh, from our experience. So uh, from the perspective of an, of an SME, reducing emissions, it, it's, it's not rocket science as such. Um, SMEs can generally move very quickly to target their negative externalities because, for example, for example, the CEOs or the founders, they, they have a holistic view on everything that is happening. The deci decision chains are short, so intervention can come very quickly. Uh, however, the, the resources are scarce, uh, especially human resources are scarce um, for SMEs. Uh, people like me, we do lots of things at the same time, and it's kind of a luxury to participate here and to think about carbon emissions um, and I, I'm I'm really privileged uh, to, to 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 be able to to work on this um, and to dedicate so much time to it. But I don't think uh, it's 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 only an economical choice. It's also a personal choice. So um, we don't need the C2 measurement to get back to that point. Uh, either to build a strong brand story because our our history is rich. There there are many more. 
uh, point that we can score with less effort than measuring our carbon emissions. Uh, although, so it's 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 a nice to have from our perspective, and um, therefore my recommendation um, to policymakers or anybody that that is listening that has access to business leaders, um, that is that um, address business leaders directly. If you want to encourage them to implement circular economy to reduce the CO two emissions to account for them. Uh, in, in small companies, people decide, and it's often one person that decides how far do we push this? Do we push it beyond just saving costs? Do we even think about saving costs with this approach or don't we bother? And do we go beyond it? It's, it's often a personal choice and um, that can complement uh, other initiatives like the SME Climate Hub. For me, it really must complement it. And another one, uh, maybe it's wishful thinking, but if you make carbon accounting obligatory for all market participants, well, it stops being a cost. And if you link it to financial rewards, then obviously uh, the, 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 the loop is closed and we can much easily go to our farmers and not only beg them to, to put green covers, uh, to put uh, biodiversity um, um, like uh, hotspots uh, to 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 sow in uh, in 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 associated uh, to uh, with associated crops. All of this, it's not just a, a vision where you where you then join people. It's something where you can create extra income if you create this carbon market, which is which is not voluntary, but but it which is a really a real market. So my last point: Will we measure our CO two uh, footprint? Um, in the future, maybe I would like to do it right now, but right now we focus on reducing our emissions. Uh, but if there's anybody listening here who wants to encourage us and, and help us in doing it, uh, we are ready to go. Thank you for that. Um, very interesting to hear the SME issues and I, I appreciate like your honest and, and real sharing of the situation that you're in. I mean, you talk about the resources and the cost driven side of it that, you know, it needs to make business sense as well as making sense. Um, to, to be good. Um, I also really like about the community side that you talked about that, you know, you went together with your suppliers to work on active solutions, because I think that's so key for the circular economy. If you're alone and if you take your product or your service or your solution in isolation, it's very hard to make that circular. But when you start building um, an ecosystem where you can kind of place your solution or product in a bigger perspective and work together with other stakeholders, it's much easier to be able to reduce, to find more circular solutions, to find alternatives. So I think that's a really good sharing and a key point. Um, we have another case study to be shared with us. Uh, Julia Breidenstein, a PR manager at Humana Kleider Kleider Samlung GmbH, apologies for my German pronunciation, uh, who's going to tell us a little bit how uh, Humana is working uh, with the circular economy. Yes, thank you so much for um, having me, Normative and ECESP. And thank you to everybody for taking the interest, for taking your time to listen. Here is the presentation. I hope you can see it. With yes, second hand, you. with second hand towards net zero. We are an SME collecting, sorting and selling used clothes and we are a social business. Profits are reinvested or used for development cooperation. My name is Julia Breidenstein. I am a co-founder and today responsible for sustainability, public relations and public affairs for this company in Germany. In 2019, we had 130 employees. Um, we were founded in 1988 and today we are in almost all federal states of Germany with our work. We are a partner to organizations within the Humana People to People International Movement. Uh, that works in 45 countries and reaches 9.6 million people. Yes, this is figures from 2021. A word on the textile sector as such. 
textiles cause 8 to 10 percent of all global greenhouse gas emissions. Production doubled over 15 years. There is, to our best knowledge, no pathways scenario to net zero for the textile sector yet. And no pathways to decent clothes for all. Cotton competes with food concerning agricultural land. Man-made fibers are mainly made from oil, causing massive greenhouse gas emissions already at the extraction stage. Fiber to fiber recycling does not provide the solution. Second hand counts. Unlike other so called waste streams, used clothes have a great use value. Of the clothes we collect, 80 to 85% are worn again as clothes. Secondhand clothes help to avoid production of new clothes and thus help to avoid greenhouse gas emissions. 70% of all people on Earth buy secondhand as it is affordable and trendy, and environmental consciousness is rising, not only in Europe. Most EU inhabitants want secondhand to be promoted more. In the EU, 40% of clothing is being collected and most of it is worn again as clothes. In Germany, 75% of clothing is being collected and the collected amounts in the EU are expected to grow in the next years. Our journey, the environmental impact. Our impact in scope one, two and three in 2019 along the entire global value chain from collection to next user. I mean, we collect with uh, bins at the street side, so we collect from consumers. Um, the CO2 equivalent emissions cost in the operation, in our operation and the one of our partners until the next user was 10,308 tons. But uh, look at our handprint as opposite to footprint. Handprint is what we saved by substitution of new clothes. It's 156,748 tons of CO2 equivalent. So uh, I can confirm this uh, expression that Christian from Normative was just saying, power of 10, that is uh, nicely confirmed here. It's more than 10 times as much uh, savings that we can do compared to the CO2 we cause. Our conclusion from this is to best serve sustainability, we must grow our business. Our journey. Commitment to growth. The discussion on sustainability rightfully puts a big question mark to the concept of growth. However, some sectors need to grow a lot in order to make net zero possible. The renewable energy sector is one example. Another one is the second hand sector as part of the circular economy. Globally, Exports from the four main export regions, EU, USA, South Korea and China, have tripled over 15 years. Our journey, transparency. Since 2014, we publish our sustainability figures. First, we published the sustainability report for 2013. The complete list of disclosures was checked by Global Reporting Initiative. And here we were uh, the first ones worldwide in the second hand sector to, um, to uh, publish such a GRI report. The calculations were compliant, are compliant with greenhouse gas protocol along the entire global value chain until the next user. 
Then we also published the sustainability report for 2016. And here we also got external verification for almost 70% of our global product stream along the value chain for reuse, recycling, waste, and for the destinations. Uh, covering all receivers of more than 1,000 tons of clothes, our aim is to cover all receivers of more than 100 tons of clothes. So we are working on this. And then we uh, published the sustainability key figures for 2019. Our journey, compliance. Since 2018, we involve our partners to increase compliance. Code of conduct for Humana people to people collections. Humana people to people principles for the supply chain about human rights, environment, business, governance. So then you can maybe ask, what does that help on the greenhouse gas emissions? I would say it helps us on our journey because like this, we are in discussion with our receivers of the clothes about how to improve business, who is signing, what to consider and so on. Our journey. Traceability. Since 2020, we develop and implement a specially tailored digital system for global traceability of each collie collected, sorted, delivered in cooperation with our partners. And uh, we see this necessary in order to really uh, get hold on also carbon emissions. But it's also because people they ask, where's my clothes going to when they put it in the container? And also the receivers of the clothes want to know where do the clothes come from? And it helps us ensure a good quality. Our journey, targets. In 2022, this year, we decided to reduce greenhouse gas emissions per ton clothes collected, covering scope one, two, and three with 30% by 2030 compared, compared to base year 2019. We are looking into science-based targets, United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, the UN Fashion Industry Charter for Climate Action and Pathways to Paris by PricewaterhouseCoopers, World Wildlife Fund and the German Agency, Environmental Agency. This means renewable energy in own cooperation that we have since long. Photovoltaic on our roof for electricity and heating. We are working on that one even more efficiency in transport and electric vehicles. What we find useful. Global reporting initiative standards. Greenhouse gas protocol corporate standard. SDG action manager by UN Global Compact and B Corps. And the science based targets. What we think is needed, standards, tools, trainings and counseling should be made available for free, should be translated into all languages, should be universal for use in all countries. Policy recommendations, see Ecopreneur EU's position paper on carbon pricing published last month. Last words, always keep in mind and listen to the most vulnerable ones of our stakeholders. Thank you. Thank you very much for sharing this very hands-on example of a circular business model that can reduce carbon emissions um, directly and very much focusing. Uh, I think it's important that you mentioned the handprint that, you know, it's also the power of 10 that you and Christian mentioned that the savings by finding an alternative that you can do. I think that's um, really impressive. So thanks for sharing this. Um, 
This also links very much to, you mentioned trainings and the resources that you'd like to see. That is something that uh, the SME Climate Hub is working very <laughs> intensively with. So this is a quite natural handover to Pamela. But also, you know, I'm, I'm very pleased that cir the circular economy and carbon reduction, it's so real for many businesses. And, and what you Juan Falk was also speaking about before that, you know, there are these resources available. Big businesses want to help smaller businesses. There is a community out there. Uh, as normative, we are doing a lot of educational series and webinars and tools available on our website. But there are so many that wants to help businesses do the right thing. And this is the time to take action. That's my very personal opinion anyway. <laughs> so thank you, Julia and Pamela. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Cassandra. Great to be here and absolutely wonderful to hear from Stefan and Julia, two fantastic examples. And I listen very carefully uh, to their comments and thoughts, which I will try to address because obviously SMEs are, you know, the beneficiaries that the hub was created for. So as you will have guessed, I'm here to talk about the SME Climate Hub, which is a joint initiative of the Women Business Coalition, the Exponential Roadmap Initiative and Normative. So you've already heard from Johan and Christian. And so I guess this is uh, my turn. I'll share my screen. I have a presentation that I wanted to walk you through. There we go. So you should be able to see this and I'll go into presentation mode. Yes, we can see it perfectly. Thank you. There you go. So first things first, I just wanted to say a few words about the hub. So who we are, what we do. The hub was created as a single platform, so a one-stop shop where SMEs, so small and medium-sized enterprises, can find all that they need to reduce emissions. And as we've been saying all along, emissions reductions and, and circularity really go hand in hand. So more specifically, SMEs can do three things on the hub. They can make a commitment that is aligned with science, the 1.5 goal of the Paris Agreement, and this is what allows them to join the United Nations Race to Zero campaign. So the biggest non-state actor campaign that was ever run. Uh, and I'll say a few more words about this in a minute. But we are the official pathway for SMEs to join the campaign. They can also access, and hopefully Julia will be happy to hear this, they can access free best-in-class tools to measure their emissions, but also act and report progress. And we're also working on a number of incentives to really encourage SMEs to reduce their emissions and, and by doing so also drive the circular economy. Now, all that we do is based on our research and understanding of the role of SMEs when it comes to climate action. So first of all, I think we all know that SMEs play an absolutely key role, both at community level and as part of global supply chains. And again, Christian and Johan um, have been telling you more about this. So we know SMEs make up 90% of businesses worldwide. They employ 2 billion people. These are just a couple of stats, but we could share many more to explain why SMEs are so important. And on top of that, we also know that they're very vulnerable. About half of them never reopen after a disaster. So there's a real, real need for them to work on business resilience and really adapt their business models and the way they operate to you know, the context that we're all faced with. And last but not least, we know that SMEs face specific challenges when it comes to common action and more generally you know, working on their business models and thinking about circularity. Some of these were actually mentioned by Stefan just a, just a few minutes ago uh, based on a survey that we ran with our SME community a few months ago. We were able to identify three main barriers. The first one is the lack of resources, and that includes time, money, staff. The second one is the lack of knowledge and know-how. So SMEs don't always feel like they have the right skills. They don't know where to look for the information they need. And then obviously the lack of incentives, including financial incentives. Even though I will say, and again, this links back to one of the points that Stefan made earlier, the vast majority of the SMEs we surveyed, 96% of them mentioned that they wanted to take common action because they felt it was the right thing to do. And many of them did recognize that it was a way for them to grow their business, which I guess is a good segue into this slide, which really explains why taking common action is so important for 
businesses generally, but even more, more so for small businesses, because small businesses, SMEs, you know, working on their emissions, working on their circular models are in a better position to meet the shifting expectations of all the stakeholders they have to deal with, from you know, consumers to large corporations. You know, think of what Johan was saying earlier about you know, big corporations working on their supply chains and value chains, and also obviously changing regulations. And I've listed here some of the benefits of taking common action, which again were mentioned by you know, our two SME speakers. It goes from gaining a competitive advantage, as I said, you know, growing um, the business, the brand, but also improving efficiency, which helps drive down costs and generally speaking, manage business risks. And also it's becoming a great way to get easier access to capital because investors are changing their investment criteria as well. Now, you know, I've given you the elevator pitch on the SME Comment Hub, but let's look at how it works in practice. So we recently relaunched the website to make it even more user-friendly, and we basically walk SMEs through a journey that we designed for them, and that goes through three steps. So the first step is really for SMEs to understand where they stand. And this is why we you know, offer a number of tools. I'll show you what they look like, including uh, a measurement tool. Now, all of this is accessible for free before SMEs make the commitment. And that's the second step, really, that we encourage them to take. We encourage them to make the SME climate commitment that gives them access to the race to zero. And once they do that, it unlocks additional resources and incentives for them to take action, you know, think about emissions, circularity, and the rest. About the commitment first, I wanted to do a bit of a deep dive into a couple of uh, components of our offering. So the SME climate commitment is a very simple commitment that has you know, three different aspects. It's about having greenhouse gas emissions uh, before 2030, achieving net zero before 2050. We actually give SMEs three different options. They can select 2050, 2040 or 2030 for uh, the most ambitious businesses. And then we also ask them to disclose their progress on a yearly basis, starting from 18 months after they make the commitment. So once again, we're trying to keep this very simple, but still aligned with science so that you know by making this commitment, SMEs can join the race to zero. I also wanted to show some of our key tools. There's a lot on the platform, really, but you know these are some of the tools that we think really help move the needle for SMEs and that are part of the journey that I mentioned before. So we have a fantastic climate education course called Climate Fit that we developed in partnership with BSR and the University of Cambridge Sustainability Leadership Institute. And this is a very practical, very interactive, and I dare say even fun. We've added videos with athletes to make this as accessible as possible. And so it has seven modules that cover everything from governance and strategy all the way to product design, operations, supply chains, even communication. So it really helps SMEs understand what climate action means for them. The second tool that I wanted to highlight and actually have a dedicated slide for this one is the business carbon calculator that we developed uh, in partnership with Google.org. They supported us. Normative are the one who really brought this to life and it provides SMEs with scope one, two and three emissions. And I'll say a few more words about this one in a minute. We also have another very exciting tool in the pipeline. It's a reporting tool, very simple, designed specifically for SMEs based on a simple framework that we published with CDP uh, at COP26. And that's really going to help SMEs communicate their progress to their key stakeholders, including you know, big buyers and investors. And last but not least, we have a library of external tools created by our partners at Oxford University. So this library it brings together a number of tools and resources that exist out there that have been developed by other organizations for SMEs or 
businesses more generally. And so this allows SMEs who have the time to dig a little deeper. And we they can use a number of filters and, and criteria to really look for the tools that are most helpful for what they want to do. But just to say a few more words about the calculator. So again, developed by Normative with support from uh, Google.org, it's been designed to be as simple as possible. And you know, I was, as I said, I was listening very careful to carefully to Stefan um, earlier. And and hopefully, you know, uh, Bonpin and other SMEs will find this tool helpful because it's a way to understand where emissions hotspots are for an SME, because. It is a very user-friendly tool because it only asks a few simple questions from you know, energy usage to the premises that the business operates in to the fleets that they, they operate. And also it asks for transaction data to provide estimates for scope three emissions. It's actually a fantastic way for SMEs to start their journey and understand you know, if they want to switch to circular systems, when, where, where should they focus their efforts? Where in their operations uh, is their most impact potential? So I definitely invite both Stefan and Julia to check this out if they haven't already and, and definitely look forward to hearing their feedback. Now, I just wanted to finish on a, on a couple of slides because I'm often asked, you know, I'm an SME, I want to take climate action, what should I do? What should my common action plan look like? Well, the truth is there's no universal recipe, right? Things will vary from one business to another, from one sector to another, but there are a few key things that any SME really should be able to do. Obviously, you know, some of these actions have to do with energy, so transitioning to renewable energy, pursuing energy efficient projects, starting from, for example, the buildings they operate in, so making sure that they can adjust in heating and cooling systems, but obviously also really important to switch to other circular systems. Uh, for example, looking at product design and how we can or they can minimize waste from their products and packaging, not to mention, obviously, you know, the importance of vehicle fleets, uh, possibly trying to electrifying them, and also the importance of collaboration, which was already mentioned by other speakers. So really looking at uh, your suppliers, but also other stakeholders that you collaborate with. And finally, this is just a, a heat map showing, you know, where our SMEs are. Uh, the hub just completed what I would call its startup year, where we were launched a, a little over a year ago. So we're now really expanding our reach and, and developing our activities, but we already have over 4,100 SMEs who've made the SME Comet commitment, and they come from over 100 countries in the world. So we hope that our community is going to grow very fast and that we'll be able to show a different map at the next event with even more countries. But I hope this was helpful and I really look forward to hearing your questions. Very happy to, you know, do a bit more of a deep dive into some of the things that we offer on the Hub. Thank you so much for sharing, Pamela. Um, it's amazing, like this Hub is free and I think one of the challenges is perhaps telling the word about the SME Climate Hub rather than, you know, doing the calculations themselves. Um, set actions today, I think that's brilliant, you know, everyone can start doing something. But with that, I would also like to say, you know, start measuring because then you can also see your success. If you start today by just looking at where you're at, you have a kind of starting point to get better from so that you can also celebrate your successes in your reductions. Um, yes, so we have a panel. So I welcome all the panelists to turn their cameras on. Uh, we're going to start with some questions. Uh, we're a little bit short on time, so we have uh, 15, 20 minutes to do this, but uh, let's Let's uh, make the most out of our time together. You can post uh, questions if you have some in the chat box. Otherwise, I, as per usual, have a full sheet with questions for our panelists. Um, starting with uh, Christian, um, tell us a little bit more about normative and how normative loops into the circular solution. In your speech, you talked about the circular economy in general, carbon emission, but where does normative fit into this picture? So brilliant question, first of all. Uh, the way we fit in is that we empower decision making based on data. So as I said earlier, circular economy is this big you know, coordination problem in a value chain. And, and in order to 
for for uh, companies to make the right decisions and make circular decisions that they they really need you know th those tools so to be more specific inside of normative uh, we have a huge taxonomy of over 2000 different activities uh, and an important part of that taxonomy is to highlight circular options so let's say for instance that you are that you know in in, in my example i had you know like gardening furniture like you know a, a steel table or something like that you know let, let's say you have the options as the manufacturer of that steel table of okay what happens if i use recyclable materials for this table what will the difference in carbon emissions be so so for us the answer here is to have that really high resolution taxonomy where you can actually see the difference between uh, you know, uh, options within the same category, where you can see the difference between the circular options and the non-circular options. Thank you. Um, and uh, where should we go from here? I have so many great questions. Uh, this is an open one, so let's jump on it. Have you experienced from your perspective a circular mind shift in general that you see more circular action, or is it still a struggle from where you're standing? Maybe it'd be interesting to hear an SME talk about this. Stefan, do you want to give your insight? Uh, I don't have much to say about it uh, other than in the last two years since I've been working on this uh, with Montpain, uh, we, have, uh, we haven't had uh, or, or we found many partners to work um, in the circular spirit with. I, I can only assume that uh, the, the willingness is increasing, the topic is becoming more well known. Um, but, but I wouldn't be able to point to, to that evolution, maybe I'm too young for this. Um, but uh, other than that, I, I think it is it is my impression that uh, upcycling uh, is being seen as a value creation more now than it was the case, maybe maybe even a very short time ago. Yeah. And um, you want from your perspective, I mean, we heard of the challenges of the SMEs that are often part of value chains and the bigger perspective and all the great that work that you're trying to do to push the enterprises to kind of support and take responsibility for your value chain. How do you kind of take this in and link this up? How, how can you support the bigger businesses to become even better to support the SMEs? What, what's your take on this? Yes, as, as I mentioned, the large companies, they normally apply this 80-20 rule, which means that they start, you know, with the big emitters in their supply chain. So there's a risk that they sort of ignore their small suppliers. Uh, but our message is very clear. I mean, first, you have emissions from your small suppliers, but you also have this responsibility to support them to get on this journey. And there is a third argument that a lot of innovation will actually come from the SMEs, not necessarily from your large suppliers. We think that that is incredibly important. So that mind shift among the large companies is really important, but it's also about what we are working on, you know, can we help them to create these recipes or so, so a large company basically, so they know how to do it because maybe they have 50,000 small suppliers, so they don't, they don't daily communicate with them. So if we can create some packages so they can actually ask and nudge their small companies to join is uh, SME Climate Hub, for example, so then they can take action, um, they can commit, they can report their progress, get support, and then also the large company would be able to get some data back so they can actually see the progress from their smaller suppliers, we think is very valuable, but also incentivize the one going in the front line. If we sort of can crack that code, we think there is a very, very strong uh, potential. So that is what we're working on. Yeah, thank you. And Pamela, do you think the expectations should be different on SMEs in terms of how much they should contribute to the emission reductions, given that, you know, a big enterprise might have a team of 20 or 50 people working with, you know, supply chain engagement or carbon reduction, whilst an SME, like uh, Stefan mentioned, there could be one person tackling the whole of the sustainability package for an SMEs. Uh, how, how do you see this and, and how do you think that, um, yeah, how do you think this comes together 
uh, with expectations, with their contributions and, and with their in, input to this process. Of course, well, as we've been saying all along, collaboration is key. So I, I really, really hope and uh, and think that we should all be working towards the same goal, which is, you know, the 1.5 degree goal. So in that respect, you know, we should all be trying to do our very best to get there. That said, SMEs, precisely because they have fewer resources, they don't have the same capacity, they cannot be expected uh, to do it alone. So that's where incentives come into play. That's where big buyers really have a role to play in investors and governments with, you know, uh, legislation and regulations that will create a conducive environment for SMEs to make those changes. And that's also where initiatives like the SME Common Hub come into play to try and, you know, fill that gap a little bit and, and help businesses that have uh, fewer resources to get started. So to start the net zero journey. And again, I'm not saying that there are not other frameworks and, and resources out there that small businesses, you know, can use, but it is important for them to get started and they can find all that they need to take that first step on the hub with the recognition that comes with it, that will allow them to collaborate more closely with other stakeholders. Thank you. Uh, Julia, it seemed like when you presented you're very advanced in your work in, in uh, you know, counting and reducing for your uh, emissions. What have been the main challenges from your perspective uh, in your journey that you talked about? Yeah, first, uh, I mean, when we started in the 80s, our concern was entirely to raise funds for development. I mean, we had this about fighting poverty in Africa on our heart. And then we did this with the second hand clothes, like a common sense thing. It's stupid to throw something in the waste that could still be used. But uh, I first got aware about the huge environmental impact when I started calculating it for our first sustainability report. I was kind of shocked and I was recalculating and recalculating because I thought I had maybe taken factor 1000 too much or something. I couldn't believe it, especially on land and water. It was like crazy, but it is the correct figures. And uh, that is, of course, um, then also giving a, a push. That's also why I would encourage everybody to measure these uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions because, uh, yeah, I mean, I think also in the SMEs, you very often have people who want the good, who want to make a, a difference in this world. And when uh, they get a help, they will for sure do it. But it was a very long journey for us to get hold of how we should do it. And I think um, just for looking at the business, we never thought it was a big advantage for our business. But uh, we did it because it was like, I mean, we can see the heavy impact of climate change in this, especially global south for the small scale farmers. It is, it is terrible. <laughs> And, and from there, of course, whatever we can do, we shall do. And um, both for our company and for me, it is something that lies at our heart. But actually, after we have been doing all these calculations, we find that our cu customers in the Humana secondhand shops, they react very much uh, positive to it. Because uh, and a growing number of people, they say they only buy secondhand now. And that is because of the environmental reason. So that's great. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I, I agree with you, and I I'm gr glad to hear that you see direct benefits to your business uh, of doing the right thing. Um, Christian, I mean, you're obviously working uh, directly with measuring uh, a lot of these business emissions. Uh, are there easier ways to get started? Are there more? You know, we talk about hotspots quite often. Like, are there quick fixes that? basically small or large any business can do in order to reduce their emissions? So a, a general principle for, for finding hotspots is to follow the spend, right? Uh, right now we're actually in a situation where the carbon accounts, even amongst large enterprises, are not really comparable. And a lot of that is related to a scoping issue. So what we say at Normative and use as a principle, both for both for the business carbon calculator that we developed for the SME Climate Hub that is kind of simplified. We, we say that, you know, 
we, we want to kind of analyze the entire cost base and try to estimate emissions based on how much have you spent on electronics, how much have you spent on electricity, how much have you spent on transportation services, because that gives you kind of the bird's eye overview. Obviously, using spend-based figures is not going to be the complete truth. But the important thing is, will it be an actionable truth? You know, will it open your eyes on here is an area where I need to focus a little bit more? Uh, so for the business carbon calculator, we ask the SMEs, how, how much have you spent in total? And then we ask them to kind of allocate that over different budget posts. For our large enterprise product, most of the large enterprises have procurement systems and ERP systems. And we ask them, can we analyze all of that data? Uh, and, and it might be, you know, tens of thousands or a hundred thousand suppliers. And then we can give that bird's eye overview of how, how who do you need to, to engage with? And as Julia said earlier, like often there is a little bit of a shock, especially in scope three, like, wow, these emissions are pretty large, but you know what? That also creates a huge opportunity for reduction whenever you find those hotspots and whenever you are presented with, with the right actions. And for, for larger enterprises, the action is often, you know, working with your uh, small uh, enterprise suppliers and get them on board. And, and that's why we're involved in the SME Climate Hub, right? So, I mean, for, for anyone who's a large enterprise listening, you know, like you should get all of your uh, supply chain on board on, on the SME Climate Hub and, and, and that, will, that will help you. Uh, so, yeah, um, that's my, my two cents. Thank you. Julia, you raised your hand. Uh, yes, uh, I just wanted to say um, the shock when I made the calculations was more about how big the savings are by substituting new clothes. And uh, and then about our own emissions, it was kind of opposite shock because it is actually not much that is uh, caused by the operation. Just to... Yeah, I, I think you. that's a good clarification. And I think especially <laughs> in your business, since you're a circular economy actor, I think the shock will more be for, you know, uh, anyone else like, OK, like, <laughs> I mean, it, it is actionable insights, right? If you if you leverage circular economy practices, then, then the upside is, is huge and, and, and enormous. So thanks Thank for you. clarifying that. Uh, you on your next. Uh... Yeah, I just like to reflect on some really good things. Uh, connecting back to Julia, you talked about the need of growth for climate solutions companies. Yes, absolutely. We that's what we call, you know, the exponential roadmap. We need exponential growth of climate solutions. That is the only way to shift out the old. Uh, so, so that's so incredibly important. So. So in this, we're working on what we call the simplified reporting also at the SME Climate Hub. So what we will also introduce is this possibility for companies also to state that they are a climate solutions company in a, in a quite simplified definition, because we have so many small companies which provides solutions which dramatically cut emissions. And um, that is important to highlight for a small company actually we should grow as much as possible and then, of course, uh, keep track of their intensity, basically. So they might go for halving their intensity. Of course, any business need to take, take care of their backyard to be credible. That is for sure. So that, that was one thing. Another thing we will really implement, which I think is straightforward, but quite innovative as well for small companies, it makes sense also to report on the key actions because the protocol might be a little bit sophisticated, but if you know that, okay, I actually taking, uh, taking actions in terms of cutting where, whether it's travel emissions or it's, it's my particular material where I'm moving to recirculate the material, I can actually start to communicate that in my simplified report to my stakeholders. So this, I think, would be very powerful also for small companies, just to mention that. Thank you for sharing. Stefan. 
Um, I just want to add uh, the topic of risk and re rewards um, when you can point to uh, a big uh, area of emissions, for example. Uh, well, you take action. That's the logical um, path to, to, to take. And then you reach out if it's in the in the value chain reach, you reach out to this uh, potential partner where you can uh, reduce emissions. Uh, in our case, as I said, it's it's agriculture. It's pushing the farmer to work in agroecology. So uh, now this farmer invests uh, with you and um, this 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 comes with an expectation of loyalty. Uh, and I think in many big businesses will need to 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 to, to be aware of that, um, that they create expectations when they when they initiate an investment. And in our case, although we are really a tiny SME, uh, we are in this situation where we go to farmers, we tell them, use green covers, please, uh, don't plow. Uh, we, we, we give them a lot of conditions. And then what happens when the harvest is just really, really catastrophic, like it has been last year? We are bound to this farmer. We get a grain that is really bad. We try to work with it. We this inflicts huge costs on us, um, and uh, the farmer is unhappy. We are unhappy, and in a in like before all of this, uh, we would just look at the market and see, okay, the harvest was good in France. It's just buy grain in France, uh, but now we cannot. So um, I don't want to be the the, the pessimist in all of this, um, but with with identifying this huge opportunity uh, comes a responsibility, and um, managing this uh, is is not not as straightforward um, as one might think, especially for a small company that has scarce resources and that that can't uh, it can't um, uh, it can't invest in the wrong way. It doesn't have the treasury to take a big bad decision. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. I think it's a very important point that this goes two ways. We can't just have the large enterprises imposing all of these requirements on SMEs so that they can shine in their annual reports. It actually needs to be meaningful two ways, that there are incentives, there are rewards, there is loyalty going both ways, and that uh, you know you make sure that everyone walks out of this as winners, uh, and especially the climate, of course, should be the big winner of, of the discussion. But. Um, so thank you so much. Uh, time flies when we're having fun. Uh, thank you to our panels and to everyone listening in today. Uh, this uh, talk has been recorded 